founded possibility research and self-aware systems to develop beneficial intelligent technologies. He's got degrees in physics and math from Stanford and a PhD in physics from Berkeley. It's a great combination. Um, he's published a book. He's designed AI programming languages, Starkless and Sather, and uh, wrote the 3D graphics system for Mathematica. He's uh, developed a number of machine learning algorithms that, um, and to build systems that learn to read lips, control robots, and do grammars. He's also on the advisory board of a blockchain startup, Definity. Steve. Thank you. So, thanks for all coming. Um, I'm going to talk about two very, very popular technologies, AI and blockchain. Blockchain seems to be exploding everywhere uh, last week or so. And how they relate to deception. And uh, let's start with deception. Throughout history, politicians uh, enjoy sort of modifying media to sort of put them in a better light. And uh, particularly uh, politicians like Joseph Stalin, uh, whenever somebody kind of fell out of favor, he would delete them from history. And uh, so here's a really classic one where the original picture had four of them, and then gradually each one pissed him off, and he sort of deleted them. It ended up with just, uh, just himself. This is the 1920s, so the technology they had for doing this kind of modification was mostly in the dark room, and then if you look at this picture, it's uh, done with a paintbrush. And so, pretty crude, and by today's standard, you can look at it and see that, oh, that's not the same as that. You can sort of see the artifacts. Um, we did this in the U.S. as well. This is a classic picture of Lincoln, except that it turns out it's only Lincoln's head. Uh, they stuck Lincoln's head on uh, John Calhoun's body. <laughs> Today, if you wanted to do this kind of thing, Photoshop is the go-to tool. In fact, the word shocked has sort of become a, uh, you know, a phrase. I don't know if it's in the dictionary yet, but it probably will be soon. Um, you can do pretty good jobs of uh, you know, deleting things, adding things, but they leave artifacts. And there are a whole bunch of tools that people have created to look at images and try and find where the Photoshopping has happened so that you can sort of detect that they've been uh, modified. And uh, those kind of tools were not very good for doing things like faces, either changing faces or creating faces. You tend to get uh, things that look like this that are kind of creepy. And in fact, in uh, 1970, uh, Masahiro Mori uh, created the term uncanny valley, where what he realized is if you have an artificial <coughs> face, uh, if it's far from a real face, uh, then as it gets closer, it, you have more and more empathy with it. Until it gets really close, there's this drop-off where something which is close to a real face but not a real face, people really recoil. And uh, a number of animated movies were made oh, about 10 years ago or so trying to animate the characters, the faces of the characters, and people just walked out of there feeling like they did a horror movie. And so, uh, so the Uncanny Valley was a challenge for many, many years. And uh, in the last few years, we pretty much have, have beat it. Uh, this is Digital Emily. Uh, she's a completely digitally created character, but most people see her as very realistic and don't even realize that it's a, it's a digital creation. Um, very recently, uh, deep learning neural nets have been used for all sorts of exciting things, and uh, people are having a lot of fun uh, using them to transfer the style of paintings to other, other paintings, uh, and in this case, to take a, a video of a, of a horse and turn it into a video of a zebra. <laughs> and if you look at the zebra, you can see the stripes kind of move around a little bit, so it's not exactly perfect, but it's pretty darn good. And, you know, another year or so from now, it'll be, you know, seamless. And they're doing this kind of thing on everything, if you can imagine. Uh, in particular, here's an example just from a, um, a few weeks ago, uh, a network that's trained on people's faces and then these are random, it has automatically generated these faces that are not real people. If you look at them closely, you can see little artifacts here and there. But they mostly, on you know, first glance, you think, oh yeah, that's just a low quality image of a real person. None of these people exist. Uh, this is a really creepy thing uh, from last week. A company called Deep Fakes, and they took the face of Gal Gadot, I don't know if that's how you say her name, the, the Wonder Woman actress, and they put her on this, the bot, this is a body of a porn star, and they made a porn movie with her face on it. And so this is like a whole new trend, and people are like, where is this going to lead? You know, you, you make a porn movie of your neighbor, or, you know, this, something like that. So, uh, lots of societal implications for some of these things. 
Uh, Adobe is starting to use some of these machine learning and neural net techniques in their tools. So Photoshop is being upgraded massively. Here's a kind of cool one they just demoed called Adobe Clunk, where uh, this is like a light pole in the shot, in this video shot, and Adobe Clunk can automatically <coughs> move the light pole, and uh, it's very, very seamless. Uh, and they have a number of tools like that. Uh, they've also started making something that some people are calling Photoshop for audio, for sound. Uh, they have a tool called Voco, which I don't think is for sale yet, but they found it, which uh, given a short segment of somebody's speech, they can generate that person saying whatever you want. And uh, there's a little startup company called Lyrebird, which is doing a similar thing. They say you only need one minute of somebody's speech to produce something, produce them saying whatever you like. So you can take Donald Trump and have him say, oh, we're nuking uh, North Korea tomorrow. So you could start World War III with a tool like this if you couldn't tell uh, that it was fake. Uh, there's a, a project called Face to Face that sort of combines a lot of these things. Uh, you can take any character you want. He's using Donald Trump here. They have a webcam looking at him moving his face around, and they translate it and they modify uh, this character so that the character on the screen says whatever he's saying. So uh, if you combine that with the audio tool, uh, you could have, uh, you know, he could say, we're bombing North Korea tomorrow and have a video of it, and it could end up on the news, something like that. And so, so that's the risk. So we're seeing that there potentially could be very big political consequences of this kind of uh, deceptive modification if you can't tell that it's gone on. So um, maybe partly because of some of this, but uh, somehow you know, near the end of 2016, I don't know why exactly then, uh, this is interest on Google and the term fake news just skyrocketed and it has uh, stayed up there. And in fact, you know, during the elections, uh, there was a, a group of uh, teenagers in Macedonia that were massively creating fake news stories uh, that were really exciting and much more interesting than the real news stories. And so people would click on them and then they would get the ad revenue from those clicks. So they were making money by creating fake news. And so that, that's a sort of economic motivation for this kind of deception. Um, the art world has been dealing with this for a long time. Uh, because uh, uh, forgeries of famous paintings, uh, if you can't tell they're a forgery, well, they could be worth as much as the famous painting. And case in point, perhaps, uh, this is supposedly a, uh, a painting by uh, Leonardo da Vinci, which just sold for $450 million to a Saudi buyer. Um, but a lot of people are like, is that really Leonardo da Vinci? <laughs> this is, it's a black and white version, but this is what the painting looked like before restoration. And a lot of people are looking at those two saying, wait a minute, this is more than just restoration. And so some art critics are saying, oh, I don't know if that's real. Uh, and so how can you tell? And so the art world has a number of things. They have these art critics that specialize in, you know, art, you know what's the age of the paint chips, that kind of thing. And uh, AI is now being used uh, in that area. Uh, there's an AI program that looks, it, it extracts the paintbrush strokes or, or, draw, or pen strokes on a drawing. And uh, it compares the paintbrush strokes or the pen strokes in a particular painting with other works that that artist has done to see if it's a similar, ha you know, if it's a similar hand. Uh, fake news. There's also a whole bunch of AI programs because that's big, big business. Facebook, for instance, uh, has a huge team. I think of 10,000 people that are supposed to remove fake news stories, and they would love to automate that process. And so there are a lot of AI companies trying to detect fake news, both the written part, the audio, and the video and images. And yeah, the results are mixed. Uh, and in fact, uh, we are in a, uh, an arms race. Uh, we've got all these tools which are making it easier and easier to fake it in more and more realistic ways. And then we have opposing tools which are trying to de detect those fakes. So we've got an arms race between the deceivers and the fraud detectors. Who's going to win? And uh, in, in uh, the cryptographic world, there's something called a pseudo-random uh, number generator, which is something that generates bits that look like they're random, but they're actually not. Uh, and the result, the sort of mathematical result that most people believe there, is that the size of the circuit required to generate seemingly random bits is way smaller than the one that can detect that those mm -hmm. bits actually aren't random, that can find the structure in those bits. Mm -hmm. So if that same kind of result applies to more complex probabilities, say, like the structure of a face or the structure of a body, then I would say that the deceivers will probably ultimately have the upper hand. That when you know, the AI, the very best AI is being applied to creating fakes, the very best AI is being applied to detecting fakes, 
the one that's doing the creating will be able to, to win that. So that means that if we want to deal with this, if it's a societal issue, we have to have other techniques. In the art world, what the main thing that they really rely on is something they call provenance, which is you don't just have the painting itself and say, is this a, a, a forgery or not? Uh, you have the history of the painting. And they uh, try to make it very, very careful, like, you know, who owned it at each moment in time, and they would have it recorded, maybe uh, notarized, and they, they follow it through its history. And if you have a complete provenance for a painting, that makes it much more likely that it's actually real. So that brings up the question, can we have the analog of a provenance for digital media? And so is there some way that we can record uh, the structure or the history of the modifications of a, of a piece of digital uh, you know, image or audio or video so that we can know, we have some confidence in where it came from and what it is? And this is where we come into blockchains. Um, Satoshi Nakamoto, a mysterious unknown person, created Bitcoin in 2008. And the key insight was something called a blockchain, which was a ledger that is sort of uh, copied all over the world. And it's uh, the whole structure of the Bitcoin system uh, cryptographically makes sure that that ledger is a very, very high likelihood. It's very hard to modify things in the past. So you can be very confident that earlier entries in the ledger are the way that they were originally put on there. His main use was uh, transactions of this money, of this Bitcoin, that you know, if I say I give this money to you, uh, that gets recorded in the ledger, and later somebody can't say, oh no, you gave it to me, because uh, it's an uh, unmodifiable thing. And Bitcoin is doing very well, it's exploding in the price, we don't know what's going to happen to it. Um, in 2015, a variant of Bitcoin called Ethereum was created. It's a very, very similar kind of a system, except that you're allowed to have uh, what are called smart contracts, which are like little programs that run on this ledger, and be very confident that those programs actually run the way you, you think you can. And so people are inventing all sorts of ways to use that to potentially run society in a more effective way. So how might we use these blockchain ledgers uh, for the provenance question? Uh, let's consider taking a still image. Uh, you could take the current state of the blockchain, this ledger, and uh, a hash, a, a, um, a number computed from the very top of the, the blockchain that's very hard to predict what it's going to be, combine that with the image, create a hash of that, and stick it on the blockchain. And uh, what that does is it tells you, first of all, if you try and change that, you Photoshop that image later, it's going to have the wrong hash. And so you can tell that the image has been changed. And it must have been created after that hash was created, because that didn't exist until uh, that, this moment. And, it, uh, but because of, and then when it was put on the blockchain here, we know that it's somewhere between these two is where the image uh, was added to the blockchain. And if camera makers got into the game and they reliably believed in Nikon, then you can have very high confidence that this image was created in this little interval of time and it hasn't been changed <coughs> uh, since. You can do similar things for space. Lots of cameras now have GPS uh, systems built into them, so they know where they are. And if you trust the camera company, that can be combined with the image to give you reliable uh, location information. And a number of people uh, in the blockchain world, in the Ethereum world, are thinking of mechanisms whereby you could use the timing of different uh, uh, servers, uh, signals from different servers, to also narrow down the location. So in that way, you can have both space and time, potentially, of a image, audio, video. Uh, it's very common now in uh, many countries for police to wear uh, body cams so that they can record arrests. So there's, you know, if there's any controversy over what happened, they can play the video. Of course, these are very important videos. First of all, you don't want to lose them. There's a surprising number of them. Oh, we, we lost the video cam, or somebody turned it off. Uh, and we also don't want to modify them uh, because this is, you know, somebody got arrested. We want to make sure this is what really happened. I would like to extend it from police to politicians. I think all politicians should wear body cams. <laughs> and everything they do while they're working for you know, their constituents should be recorded. And if we use this kind of uh, provenance system, we can know for sure exactly what they did when, and they can't change it later. Uh, so potentially, we could recreate society. Here's Moore's Utopia. Uh, using this kind of blockchain technology Grounding it in fundamental truth that is not modifiable, so you're, you can't be deceived. So we have verified audio <coughs> images and video in verified in, as to time and space. Uh, there are reputation mechanisms that people are working on that help you 
uh, identify what, which news is true and which news is fake, so we can get a better sense of what news you can trust. You can have uncensorable speech. You can have uh, truly verified voting uh, by cryptographic techniques. Uh, you can have politician accountability. And then there are some uh, really wild ideas people are exploring, I'll just say the names, liquid democracy, where you can delegate your vote to somebody you think knows more about it than you, mm. futarchy, uh, and then the backfeed economy. So these are all the ideas that people are exploring, all sorts of ways of reorganizing society, uh, potentially to create a, a utopia. <coughs>